And to those of you who are tuning in uh, on the internet now or in the future, welcome. My name is uh, Max Haven, and I hold the position of Canada Research Chair in Culture, Media, and Social Justice at Lakehead University. Um, and this is the first of four seminars dedicated to exploring the themes and topics raised in a book that I have written and that is coming out next month. Uh, the official date of the launch is May 20th, 2020, uh, titled Revenge Capitalism, The Ghosts of Empire, The Demons of Capital, and The Settling of Unpayable Debts. Uh, this book is published by Pluto Press, and Pluto are the co-sponsors of today's event, along with uh, Roar Magazine. Uh, thanks to them for supporting it. Uh, thanks to Emily and all the team at Pluto. Thanks to Cassie, who's running uh, the sort of technical and uh, administrative side here. Cassie Thornton is uh, the co-director, along with me, of the Reimagining Value Action Lab, or RIVAL, at Lakehead University. And thanks to all of the participants, the registrants, people who um, have signed up for this seminar. We only had a limited number of spots uh, for folks and we're really glad that people were enthusiastic about it. Um, if you weren't able to get in and you wanted to, we may do more seminars like this in the future. Uh, if you're just tuning in for the um, this part of the seminar, then so be it. that's fine as well. Um, I thought what I would do to start is uh, give a brief overview of the book for uh, those who are not part of the seminar but are tuning in and want to learn a little about it. And then I'll go through some of the questions that have been sort of graciously posed uh, by the seminar participants about the book and the themes in the first uh, chapters of the book. So for this week, the, uh, the participants in the seminar read the preface to the book. Uh, the introduction and the first chapter, which I'll speak about in a moment. And then uh, after about 35 to 40 minutes, uh, we'll end this uh, webcast um, and we'll go to the closed seminar for the participants where we have a more open conversation. So I hope you'll bear with us and join us again also next week and each and every Sunday uh, up until May 10th for more revenge capitalism. So uh, here on this slide, you'll see the cover of the book, which, as I mentioned, will be out next month on May 20th, Revenge Capitalism, the Ghost of Empire, the Demons of Capital, and the Settling of Unpayable Debts. And on the right, you'll see a uh, table of contents. Um, and I thought what I would do is briefly go over each of these chapters uh, by way of sort of introducing the book before we get into the questions. Um, before I do that, I'll just say that my motivation for writing the book was uh, came out of a number of different sorts of projects over the last few years that have all been focused on the question of the imagination. So all of my work as a scholar and as an activist um, has been focused on this question of what is the imagination, what is the radical imagination, and how can it be activated, and what prevents it from being activated in the world in which we live these days, and specifically under capitalism. And my curiosity has always been about not just the way that capitalism as a system dominates or vanquishes or destroys our imagination, but in fact, the way that capitalism relies upon our imagination. A lot of my investigations of that have been into the phenomenon of finance and financialization, where what appears at least on the surface to be completely imaginary wealth of uh, derivative contracts, credit default swaps, you name it, the sort of weird abstractions that are created on Bay Street and Wall Street and uh, the city of London have such incredible power over humanity. So how is it that something that is imaginary comes to have such incredible power to orchestrate the labor and the cooperative energies of billions of people around the globe. It's a terrible form of the imagination, but one whose power I think has a lot to tell us. So in the past, I've written about financialization of culture. I recently wrote a book a couple of years ago about called Art After Money, Money After Art, uh, which was about art and how art is uh, thinking through and dealing with finance and financialization. Um, in this last decade or so. Uh, on the other hand, a lot of my work has been about the radical imagination. It's been about social movements and especially social movements for collective liberation. 
Um, so I've been very interested in the way that the imagination allows us to envision that a different world is possible and bring people together in struggles uh, that are animated by solidarity to try and transform the world. Because of course, if we don't believe that it's possible to change the world, if we don't believe that any other world is possible than the one we live in, then why bother trying to change things at all? These two um, streams of thinking have led me to um, this book. And this book is a bit of an anomaly for me. Um, it's a continuation of many of the themes that I've been thinking through, specifically trying to think through the violence of financial capitalism, the violence that is unleashed by capitalism, and the way that that violence gets normalized. But it's also in some ways a slightly more um, theoretically engaged book than, than my previous ones have been, although they've all included an engagement with theory in some way. Um, Ultimately, it's motivated, as you might imagine, by the fact that I think we live in a time of revenge politics. And throughout this discussion today and over the next three weeks after this, I'll discuss a little bit more about what I mean by revenge politics. But I think on some level, even when one simply says the term, there's a, there's a moment of recognition that somehow we live in an age where the political sphere is marked by forms of antipathy, anger, vengefulness, and even political violence that even in a previous moment, we maybe didn't expect in some way. Um, and so I've wanted to understand this, but I want to understand it not simply as many sort of mainstream critics do, as the rise of a kind of uh, woeful uh, return to some bygone era, uh, but actually as something that is generated within and as a part of the sort of decrepitude of capitalism in a moment of its financialization, in a moment of its crisis. My argument in the book ultimately throughout all of the chapters is that revenge characterizes capitalism and as a result, it gives rise to revenge politics. And only when we understand the kind of vengeful techniques and the vengeful dispositions of capitalism itself, of the system itself, can we really adequately frame uh, the kind of revenge politics that now seem to be stalking countries around the globe in many ways. And indeed, only when we think through revenge capitalism and the way that a system can take revenge rather than any individual within it, but a whole system can take revenge on people, only at that point, uh, will we maybe be able to think through what I term and sort of play with in this book is the notion of an avenging and imaginary. So I make this distinction between revenge and avenging, which I'll get into a little later today and we'll return to in the fourth week of this seminar in more detail. So maybe to frame this a little bit uh, more as well, I would say that um, we have learned, many of us, and I think it's quite context and con culturally specific, but in general terms, in the hegemonic global imaginary, there has been a lesson that we've been taught about revenge. And part of that lesson I think is very valuable and part of that lesson I think is quite dangerous. Obviously, revenge does terrible things. Uh, revenge tears apart whole civilizations. We have stories from almost every civilization around the world about the dangers of revenge and the way it can rip apart communities and rip apart our very souls. And those are not something that I would uh, that I would imagine I have much to say about. I, I, in some level, I'm not a philosopher uh, as such. I don't necessarily want to speak about timeless truths of all humanity, and I very much distrust the whole impulse to do so. Rather, what I want to do in this uh, book and in these seminars is encourage us to think about revenge as something whose very definition changes and who gets to define what is vengeful and what is just who, get to, who gets to define what is the neutral implementation of the law and what is uh, what Francis Bacon, as we'll discuss a little bit today, calls uh, wild justice, uh, the, 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 the domain of witches, as Francis Bacon put it. Francis Bacon, the philosopher, uh, the Elizabethan era philosopher, not Francis Bacon, the uh, 20th century painter, I should mention. Um, who gets to define what revenge is is a matter of power in society. It's a matter of discursive power, a matter of cultural power, and that's connected to political power and economic power. And so my argument throughout the book is that even how we define revenge has been shaped by a system 
of revenge. Capitalism, I'm arguing, is a system that is taking revenge. It's taking revenge on the planet. It's taking revenge on each of us. It's taking revenge on humanity. And as a result, it not only exacts that revenge and calls it necessary and calls it just, it calls it economics necessity, calls it the law of trickle-down economics, calls it the necessary paying back of debts. Not only is that occurring, it's also shaped and shaping the way in which we think about revenge. And I track in the book the way that over the generations, especially through the history of colonialism and class war over the last 500 years, the uprisings of the oppressed, the excluded, and the uh, exploited of the world have been defamed or have been slandered by the powerful as movements that are simply uh, gestures of vengeance. Uh, and rather, what's happened is the normalized revenge that has defined the lives of so many oppressed people, the kind of everyday revenge that the system takes on us through its economic logic or through its destruction of strikes, its putting down of rebellions, its use of police forces to murder people. These forms of normalized everyday revenge go unremarked, unspoken, and erased. They're simply said to be economic necessity, simply justice and its natural course. And so ultimately in this book, I'm trying to flip the script on revenge and say, well, what if we saw what a system does as vengeful and we saw what people do when they rise against that system as forms of avenging as not simply a nihilistic spasm of resentment, which is what the powerful have always labeled the movements of the oppressed, but rather as attempts to overturn a system, not just to balance the scales, not just to have an eye for an eye, et cetera, et cetera, but actually to overturn the entire economic system. And by ec economic system here, I don't just mean capitalism as a means by which goods and services are exchanged. I mean the whole economy by which we come to imagine that justice is served. I mean the economy in the much broader sense of the way in which symbolic and material exchanges circulate. So this is the kind of bigger apparatus of the whole book. It's one that I explore a little bit in the introduction called We Want Revenge. And I go into more detail about it in the first chapter of the book towards materialist theory of revenge, which goes through uh, a number of uh, parallel stories. I've often thought about this book, especially as a series of stories that I'm trying to tell that interlock and interweave with them one another, but don't necessarily give us um, as clear a sort of argument, thesis argument, etc as many readers may wish for. And that's quite intentional. I think especially when we're talking about revenge, we have an amazing archive to work with of stories, myths, legends, apocryphal tales about revenge and avenging that we can draw on. And we're dealing with such a large and unwieldy topic that I think approaching it through multiple different overlapping and interlacing stories is the appropriate methodology to choose. So in this first chapter, I tell a couple of interwoven stories, and one of them is about Francis Bacon, whom I've mentioned before, that you might be familiar with from the history of science. He's often credited as being the father of the scientific method. Well, Francis Bacon, as many feminist uh, theorists have pointed out over the years, based his understanding of the scientific method, which comes down to us today in sort of the main philosophies of science, in a deeply patriarchal lens, one where nature was a kind of uh, passive uh, material or resource to be exploited, to be um, seduced and to be penetrated by the male intellect. Uh, Vandana Shiva and many others have sort of uh, Carolyn Merchant among them have, have made this point. And I weave this uh, discussion into a much more familiar figure to us today, that of Stephen Bannon, the sort of man who's credited to being the kind of lead intellectual behind the revanchist form of politics that of course has manifested so brutally in the reign of Donald Trump in the United States. But we also know that Bannon has been uh, quite in league with and a leader globally uh, among far right tendencies all around the world. So I tie in these two stories together along with a number of passages throughout uh, history of different struggles over the last 500 years, anti-colonial struggles, workers' struggles, 
and the ways in which they've mobilized vengeance. Now, Francis Bacon wrote a very famous tract on revenge called On Revenge, in which he ultimately claims that revenge should never be undertaken by mere sort of citizens and, and commoners. But sometimes it's justifiable in Bacon's worldview, a very conservative worldview, I should mention. He's the chancellor to uh, King Henry VIII uh, uh, and King uh, Queen Elizabeth. Uh, and was one of the people responsible for sort of orchestrating England's earliest colonial ventures. Um, Bacon argues ultimately that it's sometimes justified for the king or for the sovereign to take revenge on subjects uh, in order to essentially keep the peace uh, in the name of the greater good. And he says that those who refuse to accept this, uh, he says, quote unquote, lead the lives of witches. And those lives will end unfortunate, which is highly ironic given that there's a good deal of quite credible scholarly speculation that Bacon himself was quite involved in witch hunting and witch hunts. Certainly James I, uh, sorry, he wasn't the advisor to Henry VIII, he was the advisor to Queen Elizabeth I and James I. Uh, he was already, I think, probably a child when, uh, um, well, anyway, we can, we can talk about that in the seminar. Um, in any case, uh, he, I argue, came up with this kind of uh, prototypical theory, powerful, the theory of the powerful about revenge, that revenge is justified in the name of maintaining order and of putting down rebellions, so to speak. And that in fact, those who refuse that order, those who refuse to subject themselves to the sovereign and refuse to subject themselves to power are worthy of having revenge enacted upon them because they are the more dangerous revengers. And so I argue that throughout there's uh, throughout modern sort of capitalist history and colonial history, there's been a consistent tendency, as I mentioned before, to imagine among the powerful that the rebellions of workers and the rebellions of the oppressed are inchoate, uh, monstrous, bestial forms of vengeance, and to then use that as a preemptive justification to take revenge against them. So seeing the rebellion of enslaved people or fearing the rebellion of enslaved people, the slave owners take revenge upon those whom they have enslaved even before the rebellion manifests. So this is the sort of dominant or hegemonic theory of revenge that I'm speaking about. And then I'm trying to excavate in this chapter, this materialist theory of revenge, what another notion of revenge might look like from below. That is, what does revenge look like from the perspective of those who have refused, those who have been oppressed and exploited? So we'll come back to some of these themes in a moment when I speak to some of the questions that the participants in the course have posed. I'll go more quickly through the other uh, chapters of the book because we'll come back to them in future weeks. In between most of the major chapters of this book, there are short interludes where I take up some cultural themes or stories uh, that are, that. I think have some very interesting things to tell us about the nature of revenge. So in the first interlude, I look at the Merchant of Venice, Shakespeare's, uh, one of Shakespeare's comedies, although I always prefer to read the play as a tragedy. And I look at the way in which the revenge of Shylock, who's presented as the sort of anti-Semitic stereotype of a Jewish moneylender, might figure if we turn the play on its head. Shakespeare, for various reasons, and scholars argue about his motivations a great deal, Shakespeare presents us with Shylock as this figure of sort of monstrous, bestialized, racialized vengeance. And uh, he eventually, of course, gets his comeuppance in the play. Uh, I try and turn the play upside down and say, well, let's look at this from the perspective of Shylock as the citizen of, um, of Venice, as he is, um, the merchant of Venice, uh, uh, or a merchant of Venice, I should say and someone who suffered intergenerationally a huge amount of oppression within the Venetian cap sort of proto-capitalist society. Um, and what does then his revenge look like in this context? In the second chapter of the book, I look at a number of artists who are dealing with debt in their work. Now this follows on work that I started in that book I mentioned before, Art After Money, Money After Art. Uh, and I look at artists who are specifically in different ways dealing with, in each of three contexts, 
unpayable debts, debts that everyone acknowledges are never going to be repaid. So one artist uh, is examining payday loans in the UK. Another artist is looking at uh, debt in Greece after the Eurozone financial crisis. And a third artist is looking at the debts uh, that are owed by and owed to indigenous people living in the territories we currently call Canada. And this gives me an opportunity to look at both how debt operates as a, as a means by which people are dominated in a vengeful way, but also to ask questions about what do unpayable debts from below look like? What are those debts that are owed for colonialism, for the asset stripping that goes under the name of austerity, for the kinds of debt uh, damnation that people are forced into? So there are these debts from below that are owed within the capitalist system, but can't be acknowledged and are not acknowledged. And so this chapter, chapter two, is about sort of weighing in the balance these unpayable debts from above and then unpayable debts from below. There's another interlude after that about uh, Moby Dick, uh, a, an amazing uh, novel of revenge. And here I think through the, the revenge that is sought by Captain Ahab, and also the revenge that is sought by the whale, Moby Dick himself. In chapter three, I look at money and I look at a number of different interconnected stories about the ways that working class people have used money, have taken money back into their hands, not as a means to pay or transact, but as a surface for artistic intervention. So I look at different forms of coin carving and coin clipping and uh, redevelopment of money, not as a transactional medium, but as a medium to create uh, what I speak of in this chapter as uh, currencies of the undercommon or the undercommons. Uh, so in this chapter, I look at an alternative origin story to money uh, from the sort of mainstream dominant notion uh, the mainstream dominant notion is that money is a technology of peace, that it allows humans to transact, to meet one another, to uh, transcend borders, to cooperate, uh, and that ultimately money, for all it might lead to competition, ultimately generates a society and an economy of peace. I challenge this notion by looking at a different origin story of money in the way in which wampum, small purple and white beads, which were used uh, in a large and complex commodity economy in uh, Turtle Island or so-called North America before the arrival of the Europeans. I look at the way these wampum beads were first appropriated and then weaponized by the Europeans as a method of colonialism to try and tell a different story about where money comes from and what's going on with it that'll help us understand then the broader system of capitalism of which money is a part. Uh, in the next interlude, I look at the show uh, Khloe Kardashian's Revenge Body, uh, which I hope none of you have seen because it's terrible. Uh, it's a reality television show about weight loss. And I contrast that to some notions about the body and the vengeful body from the Zapatista Army for La National Liberation, the, the largely indigenous uprising in Chiapas uh, that has really... Uh, generated not only an incredible uh, possibility for indigenous resurgence and territorial decolonization, uh, but also has become an umbrella within which uh, Zapatista feminists have organized and developed their own critique of Zapatismo and Zapatista organization, and also a broader capitalist and colonial society. Chapter four, uh, goes and speaks in some detail about the opium wars, not only the opium wars of the 19th century where the British and French and American and other traders forced the Chinese government to open their ports to the incredibly destructive import of opium, uh, but also the way that that event, uh, that horrible event of colonialism, which led to drastic uh, social disruption and, and a huge amount of pain in China over a century, how those events are now echoed in the kind of racial capitalist politics of the opioid epidemic in the United States today, which by some estimates has killed at least 500,000 Americans, probably many, many, many more, and is a huge scourge still in many cities, towns, and rural areas throughout the United States, Canada, and many other countries as well. These were prescription opioids that were pushed by large corporations eager to make a lot of money that preyed upon all of the already existing fractures and fissures 
in the American economy in order to supplement people's lives with extremely addictive painkillers. And the uh, ramifications of that we're only beginning to deal with now. Uh, the final interlude in the book uh, compares uh, V for Vendetta from the early 2000s with the recent film Joker. Uh, chapter five takes up the metaphor of the dead zone. Uh, I borrow this from a number of other scholars, notably David Graeber and Henry Giroux, but I use this dead zone and I kind of unpack this metaphor a bit more to speak about a whole variety of other um, uh, ways of thinking about what is happening to our world uh, through the, the sort of procedures of revenge capitalism. And then in the conclusion to the book, I return to this, um, this dynamic that I'm trying to draw between, on the one hand, revenge, and on the other, avenging. And I try and separate them out between a revenge fantasy on the one hand and an avenging imaginary on the other. I try and distinguish between these two ideas in order to try and give us some resources for moving forward. And then there's finally a, a, just a small coda uh, to the book where I sort of try and summarize the main arguments of the book in sort of 11 key points. And then I recently wrote a postscript to the book, which is attached to the end of it, about our current situation of the pandemic. So in the little time that remains here, what I was going to do is put up some of the questions that have been posed by the seminar participants and try and answer them as best I can. Although many of them, I don't have a very good answer to, and I just want them to stand alone as interesting provocations for our thinking, all of us um, going forward. Uh, I've removed the names of the people who posed these questions because I didn't ask their permission beforehand if I could use their names. So to those who didn't wish to have their uh, questions posed, don't worry, they're not associated with you. For those who did wish to have their questions posed, but their name isn't attached, I apologize and we'll rectify that next week uh, for when we speak about other, other matters. And I think a number of these questions will help maybe explore some of the key themes in the book. So this question uh, picks apart a very key phrase in the introduction to the book, which um, I've been struggling with myself. And I really wanna commend the person who asked this question because I think it really strikes at some of the, the real difficulties that I had writing this book uh, and that even I'm not very satisfied with at this point. So I'll just read them aloud here. This person writes, your definition of capitalism as a revenge economy, as a system that it is that it is a system that one, appears to be taking needless and ultimately self-defeating revenge upon different populations. And this person writes, I was wondering if you could expand on the difference between capitalism appearing to be a system in which revenge is needlessly exerted upon different po populations and it being such a system. So what is this distinction between appearance and actuality? It's an excellent, excellent, very difficult question. Uh, second, they say, from which perspective is it that revenge is needless? Our perspective, which would reject it as wronging, and un uh, wrong, wronging us unfairly? Or is it needless from capitalism's perspective in the sense that it could control us without taking revenge upon us? Anon, another great question. And then third, in which way is the mode of operation of the capitalist revenge economy ultimately self-defeating? Is it because it fosters a potential for us to cultivate imagine, avenging imaginaries and through these mobilize a transformative anti-capitalist we? Again, a great question. I'll try and answer these somewhat briefly, but we'll have to discuss them in more detail in our conversations later. So the first one is the difference between capitalism appearing to be a system in which revenge is needlessly exerted upon different populations and it actually being such a system. Uh, this is a very difficult question for me, um, largely because I am still exploring, along with a number of other scholars and thinkers, to what extent capitalism's appearances become real. Uh, Marx, who remains perhaps the, the, you know, one of the best theorists of um, capitalism, uh, referred to this as a real abstraction. So an abstraction, something that doesn't necessarily exist, uh, in the world can become real through the force of its uh, operations. And the, the best example, perhaps the quintessential example is money, right? Money is not really real, especially the type of money we use today, which is just a string of numbers in a database somewhere. 
But even when it's a coin or a bill, it's not a real thing of value. It stands in for value. It is an abstraction. And it's an abstraction within capitalism of our capacity to cooperate and labor together. Uh, and yet money becomes real through our use of it. Or we could take another example of, um, you know, um, the institution of heterosexual marriage. Well, marriage is a concept, right? Heterosexuality is in fact itself a, a social construction, a concept, but it's one that becomes essentially real because we reinforce it every day through our sort of repetition of the codes, the scripts and the performances of such a thing. So in a certain sense, when I'm speaking about capitalism appearing to do something or appearing to be something, I'm referring on the one hand to this question of real abstraction and how abstractions become concrete and how concrete things then become also abstract. Um, on the other hand, I'm also trying to hedge my bets in this, in this framing, because on the one hand, we can't actually say that capitalism wants revenge, right? It, it is not a human, it doesn't have human motivations. And therefore to say it wants revenge or is taking revenge is to take some poetic license. My argument in the book, however, is that ultimately all we have in our struggle to define and understand capitalism in our moment is metaphors. And I think as a metaphor, revenge is a very useful one for explaining capitalism in our moment. So when I say it appears to be a system of revenge, I don't mean to say that it's an illusion. I mean to say that that is how it appears to us and it behooves us to try and describe what's happening underneath. And I'll come back to this in, a, in another question in a moment. Um, from which perspective is revenge needless? Our perspective which rejects it as wronging us unfairly or from capitalism's perspective in the sense that it could control us without taking revenge upon us. Part of my argument in this book is that as capitalist uh, accumulation cycles accelerate, as capitalism becomes more and more chaotic, it loses the plot, to use a contemporary turn of phrase. It starts to take actions out of all proportion. It begins to become more and more needlessly violent. And when I say needless here, I mean that the capitalist system could likely reproduce itself without so much violence. And yet violence, it indeed enacts. It does end up appearing, as I say, vengeful. But this is a bit of a moot point because what is necessary for capitalism, what is unnecessary for capitalism, it's difficult to say what would be or would not be. It's a sort of counterfactual argument you would need to make. Like, oh, could we have capitalism without colonialism? I would argue that's absolutely absurd that no, capitalism and colonialism have always moved together. But there are very reputable and interesting scholars who argue that, well, maybe it's possible. So ultimately, uh, I think that this argument is to say that this needlessness tries to refer to the extremes to which capitalism has been pushed by its own internal contradictions. And this brings us to the third part of this question. My argument in the book is that the revengefulness of capitalism is not the intention of the system, it is the effect of the system. Capitalism does not intend to be vengeful. It, capitalism cannot intend to be anything. Uh, it is in effect, in the sum of its actions, vengeful. And the reason for that is that capitalism, and this brings us to the next question, is not made up of any sort of central organizing committee, uh, as much as it may tempt us to believe that that is in fact the case. It is actually made up of the competitive efforts of many, many, many different capitalists who are all competing with one another, occasionally cooperating and colluding in cartels, in forms of sort of secret societies, if you want to believe in that stuff, uh, although some of them are very legitimate and aren't even that secret. You know, the World Economic Forum, for instance, is a big place where all the billionaires and politicians get together every year. They don't make a, they don't make a secret out of it. Um, but more, more or less, essentially for capitalism to function as such, it needs to ensure that all of the capitalist actors within it are all competing with one another. That, you know, all the airlines are competing with one another, that all the pharma, pharma tech companies are competing with one another, that all of the industrial companies are competing with one another. Whether they cooperate, uh, whether they um, compete with one another in the scale of one national economy or they compete with one another internationally. Um, and I think this is a very important point and it leads to this next question and we might, we might have to leave it here uh, for today. 
uh, this person writes, you explain in the section revenge is inherent in capitalism on page five of the book that quote, indeed a kind of vengeance is at the core of capitalism, though a revenge largely executed without any single human being intending it, operating through the everyday and allegedly inevitable banalities of the economy. And the person writes to me or writes, uh, this seems very important to me. You elaborate this by saying, quote, I am arguing that under capitalism, a system driven by contradiction and competition rather than coherence and conspiracy, systemic revenge emerges without any single agent intending it. Can you describe some of the ways that these mechanisms of capitalism that do not involve the intentions of any people interact with conditions that are social? I'm so glad that uh, the person posed this question because it's something that I've been really struggling with to articulate in this book. And I think it's very important for our thinking and strategizing as we go forward into this really incredibly dangerous moment of revenge capitalism now. Generally, my study of finance and financialization led me to the conclusion, I read tons and tons of sort of ethnographies of financiers and met with and talked with a lot of financiers. And these are some of people who are extremely powerful in the whole scheme of global uh, capitalist relations, but all of them feel completely powerless. And they all feel to every single one that they are completely replaceable at any moment and that there are dozens, if not hundreds of people willing to take their place. And this has led me to think through uh, a kind of very important lesson from Marx uh, and Marx's interpreters of Marx's work, especially I think David Harvey, that really stressed that the thing about capitalism and the reason it's so resilient and it's so adaptable and it's so dangerous is that it's not a system that relies for all of its claims to do so on a small elite that, uh, that controls everything. It's one that can conscript many, many different humans to its reproduction. In fact, my argument in the book, and it's been an argument that others have made much more cogently than I have in the past, is that this particular moment of capitalism we're living in right now is quite different from previous moments because in some way, capitalism conscripts all of us. We all become agents of capitalism's reproduction, not because we necessarily choose to do so or because we are ideologically predisposed towards loving capitalism. It doesn't matter if you love capitalism or you hate capitalism. The way in which the sort of neoliberal financialized economy has restructured our lives is such that we are all held at ransom unless we participate. And so this can happen at the top of the socioeconomic ladder. It can also happen at the bottom of the socioeconomic ladder. At the top of the socioeconomic ladder, it's easiest to see in the personage of, for instance, somebody who's working for a major investment bank, right? Investment banks hire some of the smartest, most reflexive uh, and, and thoughtful human beings. Uh, they troll the Ivy League universities and the top uh, programs around the world to find new people to be financiers. These are not beguiled people. Many of them have read extensively in political economy, and some of them might have at one point been Marxists. It doesn't care. It doesn't care what you believe. Ultimately, you can be slotted into the system at any point, and the system has enough safeguards such that if you do something that is in any way outside of the uh, framework of reproducing the institution in which you're a part, and that institution, let's say an investment bank, is itself reproducing capitalism by moving money around the world and competing with its uh, similar institutions. If you in any way break ranks with that, you're gone the next day. There's no, there's no question about it. You have a tiny, tiny latitude of freedom. And it explains why people in those positions of power tend to fetishize their latitude of freedom. So you have, you know, the very rich financier who then when you challenge them on the fact that they've just plunged a whole country into abject poverty by speculating on their currency, you know, cries foul that in fact they gave a ton of money to charity, the blah, 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 et cetera, et cetera. You know, um, there's all of these ways in which capitalism conscripts us to its reproduction. That's at the higher end. At the lower end, we can see the sort of reformation of a huge section of the working class away from the notion of stable forms of uh, employment as horrifying as they were working for Walmart or you know, working as a pizza delivery person or a cab driver or working in a hospital or working in elder care or working in all the different forms of sort of uh, exploited care labor. Uh, 
And the movement of that towards what at least appeared to be before the pandemic, the movement towards the gig economy, the use uh, the combination of Silicon Valley on the one hand and the financial apparatus on the other to really try and pry open the world of work and make us all into these allegedly entrepreneurial subjects who are no longer being employed by a single boss, but are working from allegedly working for ourselves, selling our skills, our talents, our relationships on the sort of open market. In this way, we all, despite the fact that we have no power within the capitalist system, we all in some way are tasked with reproducing it for our very survival. This is the oldest in some ways relation of capital, the wage relation, where unless you go to the, uh, to the factory, proverbial factory, the workplace, and you contribute to the reproduction of capital within that workplace, you'll be uh, you know, denied a wage and you won't be able to survive. You won't be able to uh, buy back the fruits of the working class's proverbial labor. This is the old blackmail of capitalism. And yet it takes a new and a more and more important form because in order for this system to function today, I argue in this book, we all begin to take a kind of revenge upon ourselves in a certain way, in the sense that capitalism no longer just wants your labor time, although it does want that. It also wants your very soul in order to liberate employers and to liberate capital from many of the costs of our own social reproduction, we're asked to imagine that we're all this sort of entrepreneurial agent going out and selling our skills and services, et cetera, et cetera, on the gig economy without asking for you know, benefits, uh, old age security, pensions, any of that. All of that's left up to our own financialized savings if we're so lucky as to have them. I think this gives us a little bit of a sense of some of the themes in, in the book so far. Uh, I think in a moment here, I'm going to turn off the webcast and we're gonna have a discussion with the participants. Uh, I'm happy that we've had these first few questions. There were a whole number of really uh, amazing other questions that we didn't have a chance to get to in this presentation because I tend to go on a little bit. It's a bit of an occupational hazard for professors, I'm sorry. Um, but I do hope that we'll get some in the future and maybe we'll post them alongside this uh, in, on, on the webpage. Uh, do join us in future weeks, if you'd like, in which I'll be doing much the same thing as I do here. I'll summarize uh, material from the chapters that we're discussing that week and read more of the questions that have been posed by participants. Uh, and so with that, I'll bid adieu to our live streaming guests and look forward to seeing you next.